the lyrics of the song that we heard were very appropriate. Hey traveler, the journey is over. It's time to go home. And the subject for this evening, the return journey. The thought came to take up this topic because for the last 10 days or so, there have been two themes that Baba's talked about within the Murlis. There was one full Murli in which at least eight times, 10 times, Baba used the expression, the old world is ending, it's time to go home. I don't know whether you heard that Murli here or in your own countries, but it was very striking. Every paragraph almost, after a bit, then Baba would use this expression, and Baba would use this expression. And it must have been, I think, one of the Murleys of 1968, when Baba was preparing for the final period of his return journey home. And the second expression that's been coming up frequently, and it's come up with different connections. Baba has expressed it in many, many different ways and thoughts. And it came up again today, and that was unlimited disinterest. Baba will sometimes say real tapasya means unlimited disinterest. Sometimes Baba will say, um, forgetting the entire old world with your intellect is unlimited disinterest. Different expressions, but that's the message that Baba is giving us, to have unlimited disinterest. And so, looking at these two expressions from Baba's Murali's, the message is loud and clear. It's the return journey, it's time to go home. And another experience that I've had in recent times that I'd like to share, and again that contributed to the thinking that this is an important topic to take up at this time, and that was talking to a person who's been very interested in Baba's knowledge and who's been coming regularly, and he finds it difficult to accept God, he finds it impossible to accept the concept of the cycle. <laughs> he loves the knowledge of the soul and has used it and has benefited enormously from it. And when you see Gyan again through the eyes of um, a new child, somebody who's just started to follow Baba's teachings, and He's sharing all these amazing experiences that he's having in very difficult situations um, in a number of different ways. Just simply soul consciousness, practicing detachment, seeing the other as a soul, and he's having wonderful success just using this one idea. And you know, when Baba tells us that knowledge is like invaluable jewels, you can't even calculate how much each jewel is worth well, it's when you explore using jnana in this way and you see the enormous benefit it brings and then you say, you know, it's how can I even estimate the value of this aspect of jnana? So this is the background. And then at one point, um, I took him through the introduction of the three worlds and I was more or less expecting him to come back with his response. Well, maybe that's your imagination <laughs> But instead he had another comment to make. He said, I know it. I've been there. I've experienced it. And he then described how at one time he'd been having a meditation, not Raj Yoga meditation actually. He's experimented with many different things, so some other type of meditation. But he had this distinct experience of being detached from the body and being in this place of unlimited, infinite light. And so, and he felt very, very comfortable there. 
he felt this experience of being at home, belonging there. And so, and then another person shared with me the fact that, again, people who weren't really into the subject of God, and yet they'd been introduced to the concept of the three worlds, and they'd found it very easy to take up that idea and use that idea. And so it made me come to the conclusion that at some point, everybody has to have the awareness of the soul, because that's who we are. But also, every single soul has the experience of the home. They've been in the home for a short time or a long time, and probably, if there isn't a deep connection with God, they've probably in the, been in the home for a longer period of time. And so that experience of the home and that world of light is recorded there within the soul. And what we're doing as we share Baba's teachings, but more as we share the vibrations of that truth, we're awakening that memory and that experience that's recorded in the soul so that they again begin to feel that pull towards the home. When people have remembered paradise or heaven, they've always confused it with something up above. And then it's Baba who's told us that heaven is here and the home is up there, but all the images and all the legends and everything that's been there in Bhakti describes heaven as up above. And if you think about souls who've had a long experience of the home, the time that they're closest to God, whether they actually know it or not, and the time that they're most at rest, at peace, it's when they're there. And so that is the closest experience of heaven that those souls are ever going to have. And so it seems that to talk about the home, but also to give others the experience of the home, as we come to the end of the cycle, very quickly is going to be a very important step. But more than talking about it or even giving commentaries about it, um, the question, to what extent am I ready to go home? Have I completed my journey and am I ready for this return journey now? And in a sense, the return journey takes like this. Um, when Baba left, um, Daddy was taking Drishti, 18th January 1969, and with the Drishti, within a few moments, gone. Or today you see Daddy Gulzar, and yes, the period of invoking Baba, and all of us sitting in meditation and creating that powerful atmosphere is, is a stretch of time. But yet, that moment when Daddy Gulzar loses the consciousness of this dimension and she's gone. That moment of transition, how long does that actually take? It's literally a moment. It's not a long stretch of time. And so when it's actually time to go home, it'll be very fast. But now, preparing for that return journey and coming to that stage where truly I can feel that the home is very close. And for Baba's Brahmin children, to whatever extent I'm able to experience the beauty and the sweetness and the peace of the home today, I'm not going to have that experience later on. Both that it's not a conscious experience, but also the fact that we're there so short. Um, it's a very, very short, brief time that we're actually up there. Go there, touch the home, and come down again very quickly. And so our sanskars carry the recording of the experience of the home here and now, at this moment of time, to whatever extent we experiment with that idea and experience it. And so a few thoughts on what is it that I need to do to feel that pull towards the home. And there's a lovely expression that Baba uses, and that is the sweet home. Baba doesn't just talk about the home, 
Baba very often uses the expression, the sweet home of silence. And normally, silence isn't associated with the word sweet. People out there definitely think that silence is sterile and dry. And it's Baba who's taught us that silence is not dry. Silence is actually a very sweet experience. But the sweet home and the sweet home of silence, as I sit here, do I have the awareness of being on my return journey home? That whole concept of a journey is a very beautiful image to experiment with in terms of spiritual progress because all of you have made a journey to come to Madhuban, a physical journey, a long journey, sometimes longer than you expected, but it's been a journey. And then once you've had your time in Madhuban, and most of all of you who are here are now here for at least a few days, but at the end of those few days, after Baba's meeting, you'll again start thinking about packing, and you'll be thinking about your return journey. And think about all the different ingredients that are involved in making a long journey. And first and foremost, it's a whole question of being able to sort things out. What is it I'm going to take? What is it I'm going to leave behind? What is it that is going to be needed for me? What is it that's unnecessary baggage that I can't carry with myself. It's too heavy. I've got to leave it. I've got to find a way to deal with this and finish it off. And so that whole process of sorting and the question whether I'm just leading my Brahman life on a day-to-day -day basis just as a routine. There's some souls here who've been with Baba for 10 days there's some souls here who've been with Baba for decades and decades and decades. And so there's a variety here. But it's a fact that no matter how wonderful and beautiful Brahman life is, it's sometimes possible to allow it to just become a routine. And so you have early morning rising, you have the Murali, you have your day's activity, there's a little bit of service you're involved with. And you don't go out to nightclubs and restaurants and so on at the moment. <laughs> and so you have a, a fairly steady life in that sense. And it's become a routine. And on the one hand, a routine is comfortable because you don't have to think too much about it. There's a momentum which is going on on its own. But on the other side, within a routine... There isn't any joy, there isn't any enthusiasm. And that's then the question. Is my Brahman life filled with the intoxication and the joy and the enthusiasm that I see in Nadi Kumarka? I mean, she is a prime example. And 68 years of Brahman life, now that's quite something. The most frequent expression that I hear from Baba's children abroad is the statement that I'm not enjoying myself. I'm not enthused about something. I'm finding things dull. I'm finding things boring. And it struck me this afternoon, um, I was just again seeing um, the huge number of Matajis who come to do service in Madhuban, whether upstairs or downstairs in Shantivan. And I'm just seeing that there's a spirit within them that allows them to continue in the same routine of service, whether it's rolling chapatis. And if you haven't seen an army of Matajis rolling chapatis, it's quite a sight to go and see. It's just nonstop. Three hours straight, you do nothing but roll chapatis, roll chapatis. And you do this not just once a day, you do it three times a day. And you do it not just one week, but you do it for weeks on end. And how is it possible? 
you know, on the external level, it's just routine, routine, routine. And I think most of us would get totally bored and say, well, what about my creativity? What about this? What about that? And these mother juice, they don't complain. They've got a sweet smile, a feeling of contentment, and they carry on. And so it's possible to have that stage where there's an inner source of contentment, which has nothing to do with an external state of affairs. And on the one side, it's Dariji. And on the other side, it's a very simple Mataji. But you see that same contentment. Okay, let's go back to Dariji for a moment. And to maintain enthusiasm non-stop for years and years and years on end. Um, some of you have been coming to Madhuban again for decades. And can you remember a time when you didn't see that enthusiasm in Dariji? And I know that last year when we'd come, um, it was about this time, that's right, it was February, March. Um, her physical condition was at the lowest that I've seen it for years. But yet still, when she'd come and meet with us, it was beautiful. You know, she'd, her face would light up the room. Not just her face, but her face would light up the whole room. And so we would see that. And so my point that there's a spiritual awareness that's possible to maintain in which the joy and enthusiasm of Sangam Yuk is steady and stable and is always with you. And that's the stage in which, really, nothing here is able to distract you and pull you. And it's a question I have. Is it that I get trapped by those things, and this is why I'm not able to maintain that higher stage of consciousness? Or is it that I'm not maintaining that higher stage of consciousness that I get trapped by these things, what is it? Which is it that happens first? I think probably it's the latter. Why? Because if I were to maintain that stage, then really these things wouldn't matter 1%. This thing, that thing, and the other thing, and the other thing, it, it really would make no difference. And where I'm saying that, well, let all these things get sorted out and then I'll be able to maintain that stage. Well, the problem there is that these things here are actually not going to get sorted out unless and until I take a jump and create that high stage. And the reason is that whilst I stay on this level, there's one action and another reaction, and another reaction, and it's endless. Action and reaction, and where does it stop? It can't stop. It's a continual cycle. It's not going to stop. And that's the problem. That whilst I stay within that cycle of action and reaction, this happened, and so this is my response, and while I stay in the corporeal world, in that awareness, I'll be here till the end of the kalpa, and I'm never going to be able to finish it. And what does Baba teach me? Baba's saying, okay, you've got all your karma here. Even if you've settled your karma with lockics, well, that's a big step. Yes, it's the step that Baba describes as the living death and the rebirth. So I've died from there and I've taken birth here and this is my family and that family in my consciousness, even if on a physical level, I'm still with them. My attitude towards them, my relationship with them, my awareness of responsibilities towards them, it's different. And so I've taken birth here. But... When a child takes birth with a new family, even though the old karmic accounts have been settled, with the new family, it's starting to create karma there. 
And the problem here is a bigger one than that. Once I take birth in the divine family, there's two very powerful currents at work. One is the fact that there's a backlog of 63 births of karma that I'm settling with these souls here. But also, if I'm not careful, I'm creating more karma with them here and now. And so, you've got a nice little account that's being created and not being settled. And it's not going to get settled unless I take Baba's invitation. And Baba says, okay, belong to me, come home with me. And in that awareness of recognizing Baba, recognizing that it's time to go home, I let myself take a jump and stay with Baba in the experience of the home. And from that experience, then I come back here and I keep that awareness. Not that I come back here and I get trapped into the past karma and the present karma, because both are very powerful energies, but I come back with the awareness that I've come simply to pack up. That's what I've come to do. I haven't come to allow the action-reaction chain to continue. I can't let that happen. Because the other problem, why the present karma with souls within the alokic family is so strong, is because I now have gyan. Where I didn't have gyan, it was one to one. One karma, one reaction. Today, I have gyan. And so gyan multiplies the responsibility. Fortunately, because for everyone, it's a thousandfold return. But unfortunately, for every thought, every moment, every word that's away from Srimad, the comeback of pain and sorrow is as intense. That's the problem. And so when I said that it's 63 births of karma that we're settling, because it's with these souls that we've been through the cycle. How long I've been with my lokiks, who knows? Maybe it was just that one birth. But this is why when we come to Baba, there's immediately that sense of belonging here and a very strong bond that connects us all together because it's a journey through eternity. Being together, not just one cycle, 10 cycles, 100 cycles, but infinite. You know, somebody said to Mama, but Mama, it would be so nice if you could say this is the 1400 cycle or this is the 1500 cycle. Can't we say that? Can't we count the cycles? And Mama, with total wisdom and a very sweet smile, said, if you were to say that this is X plus one, X plus two, then even that would be a difference within the drama, and the drama is identical. And so I can't even say that this is X plus one, or X plus two, because that would make it a difference within the drama. No, identical, and so infinite. Um, I mean, just the depth of drama and Mama's wisdom, of course, Baba, but then Mama very much a human being. Baba, we'd always say, well, he's God's chariot, and so there's special power there. But Mama, a human being, and yet, what is it that made Mama attain her karmati stage and be ready for her journey home nearly 40 years now, 40 years ago practically? Um, it was that she took every aspect of Baba's knowledge and experimented with it deeply. Just sitting in solitude, in silence, and solitude doesn't even necessarily mean finding 
a quiet spot on a mountain top, but the Hindi word for solitude is ekant, to go into the depth of one. And so it immediately takes away this idea that you have to go running off externally somewhere. It's nothing to do with that, because wherever it is you go, you carry your thoughts with you, you carry your sanskars with you, and the storms that come in the mind are as intense as if you're in a gathering. But to create that space where you're able to go into the depths of one, now that is solitude. And so in that stage to be able to prepare. And so let me be able to come to that awareness of experimenting with each and every aspect of Gyan so that I'm preparing to go home. I'm aware that it's my return journey. And then I'm not extending all my luggage and baggage. Um, you know, however much space you're given, you tend to fill that. Have you seen it? <laughs> Those who are in Raj Rishi with 10 beds in the dormitory, you're given this much space and one cupboard, maybe half a cupboard, and it's okay, you can manage fine. But if you're given a room with four and there's more space, or if you're given a room on your own, or if you think about your own Lockick home and you have not just a room, you have a whole apartment or you have a whole house, you fill all of that. <laughs> and so it's uh, Murphy's Law. You, you fill in whatever space you have <laughs> and there's no space spare. We're now in Diamond House in London and whoever sees the facility is amazed because we've actually doubled our facility from what it was in Global House to Diamond House. And would you believe it? There isn't enough space. <laughs> There's this thing, there's this thing, there's this thing, and this thing, and there isn't enough space. And of course, it's on the one hand human nature, but it's also the story of Sangam Yuga, that however much space you have, it's not enough. So it carries on like that. But it applies in terms of karma also. However much space I have, I fill that with my karmic accounts and my karmic connections. And so... When I remember, it's the return journey. It's time to go home. It's time to start packing up. It's time, instead of expansion, to come back to the essence. And coming back to the essence, then I'm focused, I'm concentrated, I'm filled with my original power and strength and energy. And in that state, I am full. Why there's a feeling of discontent is because I don't give myself time to become full and keep myself filled. And so with my energies scattered and all my karmic accounts taking up all my time and attention, there's no time to be full. And so I think really that question that I asked is it these distractions that prevent me from reaching that stage? Or is it that because I don't have that stage or I get pulled into these? Well, everyone, lokik, alokik, we've got a lot of stuff spread out here. Nobody's free from it. Everybody's in the same situation, absolutely. But those who manage to start settling are the ones who keep the consciousness there and with that, coming back down here, you're in that awareness of not expanding anymore, but starting to pack up and starting to come back in. And so the packing for the return journey is the most important thing. First of all, the sorting process. What is it that I have to let go of and leave behind? I'd like to take up this aspect of letting go for a moment. Um, it's an expression that people use a lot abroad. Um, I don't know about India, but certainly abroad it comes up frequently. And it's a fact that at the time when you're traveling, it's actually very easy to let go. You know, 
it's not my business. Whoever's left behind is going to have to deal with it. I can let go. If I had to stay here and deal with it all and sort it all out, it would be more difficult to let go. But because I'm going on a journey, it's easier to have that inner detachment and say, it's okay, it'll be fine. I don't have time to think about this. I've got other things to deal with. Whoever's there is going to sort it out. And so that process in which I don't hang on to things, but I let go, when you're on a physical journey, it's automatic. You have to. You can't be traveling and then worrying about things left there because otherwise you'd just be on your mobile phone nonstop. And sometimes people are. But, <laughs> but most of us, you know, when you leave a place behind, you leave all the stuff there with it, you let go, and you move on. Same principle. I'm on a journey. Baba's taking me home. And there are things that I can't sort out just on my own. And it's going to take time for things to settle and be resolved. And it's not even going to be me that's going to be able to settle it all. It's in God's hands. Together with the expression of let go, there's another very lovely phrase. And let God. And so let God be responsible. You know, when Baba tells it's an expression Baba often uses in the Sakar Murli. Don't take the law into your own hands. And this is what Baba's saying. You've seen something and it's not right, but am I going to be able to make the other person understand that it's not right? I can try, but maybe they'll understand, maybe they won't. Or maybe even if they do understand, are they going to do something about changing it? Maybe they won't. Just as I've got some scars that I'm not ready to change, I say the sun scar is not letting go of me, but it's actually me not letting go of the sun scar. So I'm hanging on to things. How can I possibly insist that somebody else change? It's not in my capacity to make someone else change. Sometimes it's not even in my own capacity to make myself change, but definitely it's not in my capacity to either make someone realize anything. You know, we use this expression sometimes, I'm going to make you realize this. And it's when we are frustrated and upset about something and we want somebody really to understand. And we try, and from the look in their eyes, it's quite clear that they're not understanding. They're in a different space completely. And so in the whole process of letting go and letting God, what I can't do, either for myself or for somebody else, trust. Trust that God will do, both for me as well as for them. And so either in terms of realization or in terms of transformation, it's only God who can actually make someone else change. And I'm also actually appreciating that sometimes even Baba detaches. And Baba says, I've told you everything. Now whether you change or you don't change, your destiny, your fortune, especially in the Sakar Murli. And I'm thinking about Brahma Baba, the human being. Earlier I said that we always think of Brahma Baba as God's chariot and Shiv Baba in Brahma Baba. And yes, Shiv Baba paid rent. It's an expression that Baba used in the Sakar Murlis a few times in the last few months, that just as a person occupies a house and it's not their house, they, they've taken it on rent, so they have to pay rent. And so Brahma Baba's chariot, it's not Shiv Baba's property, it's Brahma Baba's property. And so Shiv Baba coming to occupy it pays rent. Just as with Dadi Gulzar, Baba has been paying rent. It's a wonderful story of that and ask her what rent Baba gives her, she'll tell you. 
it's it's a good question to ask her actually <laughs> and um she's she's shared it a few times privately but i don't know whether she'll share it in public she may <laughs> but he does pay rent um same thing with brahma baba shiv baba has paid rent and so there's extra help that brahma baba has which is the rent but also it's brahma baba making effort on his own and so brahma baba the human being think about the situation when the family at its largest was a few thousand um the numbers that come to shantivan now 15000 20000 it's a fraction of the family but in sarkar baba's days the total family would have been 10000 15000 maximum and how many would come to madhuban at the most it would be 150 200 this morning when i was in the small history hall um and daddy ji was talking beautifully about each of the pictures and taking us through the whole history um i was recalling you know as she was speaking um i was very glad i wasn't translating because her 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 thoughts were actually taking me down memory lane in a very powerful way and i was remembering that baba would sit at the front today we were seated seated that way but um the other style theater style um when we'd all be sitting in front of baba and baba would be seated on the gaddi and the kumaris and i must have been 16 when i first came and sat in that history hall so the kumaris were always given special privilege of sitting in the front so 16 years old and i'm sitting there and the image that's in my mind is that baba was sitting in a huge hall and i'm looking around the hall today and i'm saying it must have been the same size then <laughs> the size of the hall hasn't changed just hasn't shrunk but the image in my mind was that it was a huge hall and baba was so tall and so powerful and so strong and charismatic and so beautiful and baba and it's a little family as i say you know the, the whole family would fit into that hall when we were, we were there that was the largest hall and baba giving so much love so much sustenance so much guidance shiv baba coming and speaking the murli but brahma baba giving all of his care and sustenance and yet then as today each one number wise according to effort different souls playing games with their sanskars with each other all of that's going on and so baba in the murli telling us all the things that are shiv baba and brahma baba's inspirations and then they were saying but number wise each soul making effort number wise that's drama that's fortune baba explains and then further it's fortune it's destiny and so the point of this whole story that sometimes even god can't make a soul realize and change and then at that moment even god has to let go and say drama and so certainly for myself if i'm interested in preparing to go home and stay light and easy so that when baba calls i can fly instead of being trapped by something or another then I have to make sure that I've created that awareness of letting go letting go and that's the stage that I really have to attain I've talked a lot about the whole subject of settling karma because I think that's the big one with gyan with yoga with consciousness with awareness with practice of the ideas that baba has taught us the second area you know what is it that's necessary what are you going to carry in your 20 kilos of suitcase space baba's given us a list of the things that are needed both to be able to stay home and also to be able to come down because 
my next journey is going to be a very quick one and I'm going to come back into Satyug. And so to come back into Satyug, but also to be able to go home with Baba, as distinct to following Baba. Baba's made that distinction, right? That it's the brides who will go home with God and those who are only part of the wedding procession will be following. And so if I've got stuck because I'm settling karma in Dharamraj Puri, the land of Dharamraj, then I'm not going to be going with Baba, I'm going to be following behind, number wise. And so the stage of purity, that's the stage I need to have to be able to actually go home with Baba. And it was interesting that Tadichi picked up on this word this morning. And um, the question she'd been asking earlier had been very simple questions. You know, who's from where? How long have you been here? Who's first time? The sort of usual questions. And then suddenly she gets into this very deep question. Do you have faith in the power of purity? How many would, would say that you were committed to purity? Interesting question. And from all the Murali's that you've been hearing, you know that the subject of purity Baba has defined not only as the fact that you're following the path of celibacy, but purity in my motives. What are my motives? in belonging to Baba and being engaged in Baba's work? Or even, what are my motives when I'm engaged in my lokic work? What's my consciousness when I'm there? What's happening at that time? And so, three levels of purity in terms of motives for checking. What's happening when I'm with Baba and the family? What is my purpose of being with Baba and the family? What is my purpose in terms of service? And what is my purpose in terms of my lokic responsibilities? And just clarifying the answers to those questions for myself will give me a clear picture of how much cleaning I need to do inside in terms of purifying my heart and the intention, the motives in my own heart. Purity in terms of my interaction. To what extent, as I come into interaction with others, is there, the original purpose is important. What is the purpose of this interaction? Because connected with the subject of purity and the quality of interaction here is also going to be the other question of, well, what am I preparing to bring with myself back into Satyug? Purity is the package I go home with, but purity and connected with that are the other qualities that I bring back with myself for Satyug. And when you look at the picture of Lakshmi and Narayan, and I was just seeing that you know, 1966, when I first saw that picture of Lakshmi and Narayan. So it's been in that history hall decades now, and so it doesn't have that. Um, we must tell Nive by it needs changing, <laughs> because it doesn't have that beauty and sparkle that I remember from those days. Um, but the beauty of Lakshmi and Narayan never mind the picture and the translite, but visualize it within your consciousness. A, it's the beauty of purity, but it's also the dignity of royalty. And the way Baba always defines royalty is reality, truth. Royalty means A, reality, truth, and B, a state of fulfillment, where there's nothing more that they need from anyone else. And so that stage, 
that quality for Satyug is also what I have to prepare for here and now. And so sorting out and finishing the extension of karma, B, seeing what I have to carry with myself to go with Baba, with dignity back home, and C, what do I have to fill myself with to be able to come down again into Satyug. And you can see that if this is the focus of my attention, then the virag, the disinterest that Baba's talking about, not to get trapped, not to be pulled, not just interest in the thought of attraction, but virag means cutting, cutting everything, no bondages, no possessiveness, no links. So being free from everything here, then yes, I'm preparing to go home and there's unlimited disinterest in all the things around. It's great that we have this opportunity for evening bhattis at the moment. So we'll begin the meditation now. And in this meditation in particular, experience returning home and being in that land of silence and at this point, later in the cycle, when we actually go home, you won't do service in that stage. But today, experiencing going home and being there and sharing peace with the world. So it's benefit for me, but it's also actually service for the world. Om Shanti.